Kia ora koutou. Ko Tiffany Taku Ingoa, he kairaruku taufainga aho ki Manaki Whenua. Good afternoon everyone. My name is Tiffany and I am the events coordinator at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Before I hand over to Sam, I'm going to run through a couple of technical slides to ensure that your experience with us online today goes as smooth as possible. If you have joined us previously for a webinar session, you can ignore me for the next minute. You will notice you have a control panel at the side of your screen. If at any time this collapses, you can bring it back by simply clicking the orange arrow button. If you are having sound issues and you can see my mouth moving but cannot hear a word I'm saying, please grab the PDF in the handout section and this has instructions to resolve this quickly. The audio panel is where you can control where the sound plays on your computer. Select the drop down arrow and choose your audio output. During the presentation, you may have questions that you want to be covered in our Q&A session. You can do this via the chat panel throughout our session today. You will notice it is pretty small and it will be hard to read other attendees' questions. Select the pop-out icon on this panel and drag the corner out to make it as big as you want. You can also use this feature if you are having technical issues and ask me any questions. Questions asked by the audience show as anonymous and a green colour in the chat panel. However, please note we will use your name in the Q&A session. If I respond to you regarding a question, this will show as read. On a personal note, I would just like to thank Sam for her contribution to our webinar series. If you've joined us throughout the week, you would have seen the great job she has done at facilitating these sessions. There have also been a large group of Manaki Whenua staff who have contributed to making this week a success. It has been no easy feat turning a one-day in-person conference into a week's worth of webinars, so please give everyone involved a virtual applause. Now over to Sam to introduce you to our final session for the Biosecurity Bonanza series. Thank you, Tiffany. Kia ora koutou. And welcome to the final talk in the Mammal Pest series for the Biosecurity Bonanza 2020. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Andrew Veal, a wildlife ecologist at Banaki Whenua. There have been increasingly large eradications and control efforts for mustelids, but how do we practically scale up to even larger landscapes? In this talk, Andrew will summarise some of the recent developments and thoughts around landscape scale control of mustelids and consider where the knowledge gaps are that may prevent scaling up of operations. A Q&A session will follow this talk. I encourage you to submit questions during the presentation. We will try and get through them all, but if not, Andrew will respond by email to any questions we don't get to. I'll now hand over to Andrew to share his presentation on landscape control and eradication of mustelids. What do we know and what do we need to know? Cool. Tēnā ko to everyone. Um, ko Andrew Veal Aho. Uh, so hopefully I'm going to do what I said in uh, the introduction. Uh, basically, what I want to do is review recent uh, large-scale uh, control efforts and eradications for mustelids and then talk about some of the research that we've been doing on that. Uh, so hopefully that will be interesting. Now let's see. Boom. Okay, so in New Zealand we have three mustelid species. So this is the ferret, stoat and weasel. Um, and each of these have quite different ecologies. They were all introduced in, from, so ferrets from the 1870s, stoats and weasels from the 1880s uh, to control rabbits. Now with ferrets, it was over 50,000 of them that were actually released, uh, largely from breeders. Uh, stoats and weasels, it was over 8,000 that are recorded to have landed. And they're obviously all quite different. Now, uh, with these, um, their effects have been quite different and where they actually ended up. So they were all put basically everywhere on the main two islands. And then where they have actually succeeded has been according to the new ecology that's been established. So ferrets are basically wherever rabbits are and sometimes in forests. Stoats are everywhere. And weasels, everyone says that they're rare and patchy, but that's not actually the case currently. They like places with lots of mice, and uh, they also go up into the alpine, but they are quite hard to detect. So when I say landscape control, what do we actually mean? Now, 
there's been a lot of trapping and poisoning over community groups and councils, Department of Conservation. And so they generally have questions such as, well, how many traps are required? How long to set them? How often should they be checked? But what I'm hoping to do today is start to look at, well, can this actually be scaled up? Can we do what we do at a small scale at a larger scale? So um, Predator Free 2050 wants to get them all out of the country in the next 30 years. How do we start moving from a community group doing it to getting rid of them from national parks or from entire islands. And a lot of the time, this is a question of, well, are the tools that we have eradication tools? We've got control tools, definitely, but can we move to eradication? And then what else is needed? I think that there are some things that are needed before we can actually eradicate. Now, the best things that we can actually look at in terms of eradication is island eradication. Island eradication has only ever been done for stoats, and that's because stoats are on lots of islands. They're on over 90 islands, or have been recorded on over 90 islands. And uh, we've eradicated them from a lot of these. Why do I say eradicate in that way? The problem is that stoats swim. That's how they got to the islands. So if you take them off an island, they can get back. And so we've at least temporarily removed them from many of these islands, but the problem is that they do keep coming back. Now, almost all of the eradic, well, a large majority of the eradications that we've done are using Britificum. So this is an anticoagulant poison distributed by helicopters, and we're using that to basically wipe the island clean of mammals. And what happens is the rodents eat the Britificum, it's a slow acting poison so that over time it builds up inside them. So they eat a little bit, they think, oh, I, I'm not sick. They eat a little bit more, eat a little bit more, and then they die. And they are toxic throughout this time. So then when stoats or cats or ferrets eat them, they then get poisoned. And so it goes up the food chain. So we have actually trapped some islands to extinction. And some of them have, these islands have been moderate sized islands. So Anchor and Coal Island are the two largest ones that we've actually trapped to eradication. And these are about one and a half thousand hectares. Um, and this is using a network of traps over the entire island regularly checked. Uh, to my knowledge, Anchor hasn't had a confirmed uh, reinvader. Coal Island has. You can see it down here. Uh, it's quite a small gap. Um, and then we've got Chalky Island there, which was also eradicated, and the Passage Islands, I believe, also have. So they're trying to stop them from coming back. Now, we've been trying to scale up what has worked on these smaller islands uh, for eradication on really big islands. Now, the biggest of these is Resolution Island. Resolution Island is about 20,000 hectares and it's in Dusky Sound. I did some of my PhD work uh, here looking at the stoat reinvasions using genetics. So initially, there were 2,300 single set DOC 200 traps on the island. That's a lot of traps. It takes a workforce of, I guess, about 15 people. Uh, they check it four times a year. They go out for a couple of weeks. That's one trap every nine hectares on average, but they are along lines rather than evenly distributed. And so initially there was a knockdown, about 300 animals on the island went down and then there's a little bit of a peak. And then ever since then, there have been in uh, stoats caught on the island, obviously peaking in summer because they always are born September and then they're starting to emerge and then most recently, they caught 113 stoats this uh, summer. So that's not good. Uh, over 2015, 2016, what they did was because they were starting to, uh, this is the uh, peninsula on the seaward side of the island, they were not getting stoats there. And they thought, well, maybe this is a good place that we can actually start to introduce species. So they increased the number of traps. They increased 63 dock uh, traps and 80 uh, A24s. So these are the automatic traps. 
uh, over this peninsula and on the mainland near it. So, or not mainland, the main part of the island near it to try and prevent uh, animals coming across. And then they put dogs across the island. This is a GPS uh, track of a dog running over that, or of the four dogs, and no stoats were detected. So they appear to have been able to clear this peninsula of uh, stoats, but not the entire island. And so then they reintroduced uh, both Tiaki, the saddleback, and uh, Mohua, and they were increasing on this peninsula. Now, after that success, what they did was they increased the whole island uh, trap uh, density. So you can see these uh, red lines. These are the new trap lines, given that they still obviously had survivors. So they were trying to increase the number of traps to hopefully eradicate on the rest of it. Uh, so these were um, largely A24s. So this is now down to one trap per six hectares. You can see that this is a very dense uh, trapping network. It's over 3,000 traps now. Um, and they check it four times a year. And there's also mainland trapping uh, on all the coastal parts. All the little islands around it are trapped, and Long Island is now trapped at a similar density to Resolution Island. So you can see this is an incredible amount of work and money that is going in to try and trap this island. So here's what's happened recently. This is uh, from July 18 to uh, July 19, I believe. And green ones are just one stoat. And you can see Five Fingers has now been breached, so there are stoats on there, despite all of this trapping. Uh, and on the main part of the island, there's still quite a few. And then obviously on the coastal ones, uh, on the mainland, there's a lot more stoats being caught. And this is what happened this year. So you can see there are now lots of stoats being trapped. Now this is actually so a third of what it was uh, at the initial knockdown. So without trapping, uh, obviously this is summer compared to winter, so it's not completely comparable, but you can see that's a lot of stoats. Uh, and what this means is that there's a lot of in situ breeding and uh, these are using uh, fresh rabbit and a, uh, I think it's still fresh rabbit, maybe salted, and an egg. So this is using basically the best lures that are available with an incredibly high trapping density. And we're still getting huge numbers of stoats, really. Obviously, the mainland has more, but that's a lot of stoats. Uh, what they hope to do here is to use 1080 on the adjacent peninsulas. And this was uh, now set back because of COVID-19. Uh, but basically to try to decrease the number of stoats that can cross Acheron Passage. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I really wanted to swim Acheron Passage. It's only about 600 meters, but they thought that all the sharks would probably prevent me. And so I listened to their sage advice. They're still having some problems as well with Kia uh, dismantling the traps, uh, often using twigs and whatever tools they can, and also Weka disturbing the traps. So uh, with my genetic modeling, while there are definitely some swimming across, there's a number of uh, animals that every year are avoiding trapping despite all of this. Now, Secretary Island, which is a very similar island, it's about the same size as Waiheke, it's about 8,000 hectares. This was started earlier and it's got very similar trends. So 95 caught in the first one and then initial breeding, and then they're still getting ones uh, throughout. So it's peaking around 50 each summer. Um, and I did a lot of genetics for this uh, back in my PhD. And this is largely from in situ breeding. So there are just females that are avoiding all the traps. Uh, it's less variable. So the big uh, recent one on resolution was because it was beach mass, there were high mice densities, therefore a lot of stoats were born. Secretary Island doesn't have any other mammals now other than stoats, and therefore it's more consistent. However, the number of invaders that swim across will increase during beach mast years. So the lack of mice is a good thing in some ways, 
but it also means that in the future, so Resolution Island, maybe we could get a large 1080 operation or Britificum wipe out the mice and the stoats at the same time, because we know that works. Uh, on Secretary, we can't do that. You have to trap, there is no other option. And right now the trapping network isn't able to eradicate. So this is just an ongoing thing. Um, obviously, if we're killing them with traps, they're not then dying of starvation because they don't have any birds. So the birds are doing better, but you leave this for one to two years and it's back at carrying capacity. So this is entirely dependent on dock funding. Uh, it's challenging. So this is what it looks like. This is uh, in the last year. They have reintroduced rock wren and the rock wren are doing well there. And the kiwi, there's some evidence that the kiwi are increasing in number. So this is a multi-million dollar uh, operation and it is having effects for those birds. However, it does require everything to just continue. If you stop, it's all gone within a year or two. So this is one of the big problems in terms of mustelid control. You need to keep going forever. And part of the reason behind this is that the natural mortality of stoats is uh, about 80% in the first three to four months. What that means is that everyone does stoat trapping and over summer they catch lots of stoats. Those stoats would have died anyway. You need to catch more than 80 to 90% of those stoats to have any effect on the winter population. Otherwise, you've just changed natural mortality into trap based mortality, which doesn't actually change the population trajectory at all because they all die off anyway. So, this is the really big problem in terms of stoats. And you can see incredibly dense uh, trapping regimes don't actually eradicate, they control. Now, there are some new ones that are happening, and I've been lucky enough to be involved with the planning on them. Waiheke Island, as of Monday, it will restart trapping, and you can see this trap network is even more dense, and they're far more regularly spaced. Uh, it's basically equivalent to a 250 meter by 250 meter grid over the whole island. And the hope is, so all the modeling that we've done says, if you can eradicate using traps, this will do it. And my genetic work has shown that the island is very isolated. It's a 5K swim if you have to do it direct. That's a long way for a stoat. So this could be the largest successful stoat eradication operation. Uh, it's all pending. So this is just happening and we've done quite a lot of modeling to see what would happen. And the other big one that's happening right now is Derville Island. Uh, within the next year to two years, it will start. We're just still working on the exact timing. And while the trap density is greater than resolution in Secretary Islands, uh, it's not able to be like Waiheke. Waiheke, it's an easy island to get over and there's lots of people involved in the trapping. Derville, it's obviously more remote. So, it's going to be between 600 and 700 meters between trap lines according to the current plans. And there's a lot of cameras that they're using for detection. And the hope is that uh, using a detection network, you can then focus down onto where there are survivors. So the thought probably here is that uh, there will be some survivors initially, and then you can detect them, and then you can focus down and get those. Uh, so this is uh, proof of absence modeling, and we're doing quite a lot of that. So it basically is the probability of detecting a animal with a given device uh, and then looking at that. Now, moving to the mainland, uh, ZIP have recently done some very interesting work in the Perth Valley. And this is uh, one of the, you can tell it's a little juvenile stoat, lovely. Uh, and they have automatic lure dispensers. Um, these motor lures, uh, they pump out uh, egg mayo twice daily, and it's been done for a long period so that it got all of the animals addicted to it. And they have cameras on them, the stoats come up, they eat that, and most of them come back repeatedly because they figured a really nice uh, food source. And this is helping to target uh, any remaining ones. So this is the Perth Valley. 
uh, and it is surrounded by high mountains. So this is proper full alpine areas with uh, steep sided walls. So the thought was that you could eradicate basically everything in there and it's largely controlled by geography. And so they have a lot of cameras, so 147 cameras, and they're trying to detect everything that was in there. And let's see. Okay, not sure why there's that. Um, basically what they did was they then used 1080 at a relatively high doses uh, and application rates to eliminate all the animals in this area. That was the attempt. And amazingly, stoats were not detected from the 18th of April. Uh, they were the only animal that they believe was basically eradicated. There were some rats that survived, not many, and some possums. Again, not many, and they're trying to work on that. But uh, they were able to, basically, they think that they actually eliminated all stoats from the area. So 1080 on the mainland can eliminate um, stoats, potentially. Uh, they had two bait applications at high uh, rates over that. Um, so it is possible with toxins uh, and just 1080 to eradicate stoats over large areas if done in specific ways. So this is a really promising thing for at least mainland control. Now, if you came to Andrew's talk yesterday, Andrew Gormley, uh, he showed TrapSim which is a new thing that uh, Landcare have been developing. And this is a shiny app that you can use. And I hope that all the managers are using it. And if you want uh, good details on G0 and Sigma and all the things that go into it, uh, feel free to contact me and I can let you know. So a recent study that I was involved in was at Orokanui. And we looked at their trapping network. This is the current trapping network, the red ones. The uh, animals are simulated stoats, so that's the blue. And then what would happen with different sized grids? Uh, and so this is basically planning, if this was an island, so this is not taking into account any uh, movement, what would happen in terms of the population? And with the current trapping regime, and you can see this is very intense, they don't ever get to eradication. You always have some females survive, and then reproduce for the next year. Obviously, it's a low population each year, and this will probably have significant benefits, but it's not eradication. Now, in a mainland setting like this, where you have reinvasion, do you need to be able to get rid of every female that's within that area if they're all flooding in from the outside? Probably not, unless you have a fence or some other boundary that can stop them. However, if you have, it's actually a similar number of traps, but they're evenly distributed, uh, eradication was likely given the modeling that we did. And that's just because here you have even spacing and here you have gaps and there will be ones that go in the gaps and they're quite happy living there. They don't need to actually be uh, trapped. Another study I've recently been doing because we're hoping that, uh, well, Taranaki Regional Council is hoping to uh, remove mustelids from the uh, Taranaki National Park. So what we've been trying to do is look at, well, how do they move? Now, we know that stoats can move up to 65 kilometers. That's a dispersal that has been recorded in New Zealand. Uh, ferrets can also move tens of kilometers. So we started doing some tracking to go, well, how do they move? And we're trying to actually do that so that then we can go, here's the stoat you know super highways and then we can trap along those unfortunately i'll go back uh it's very hard work to try and actually catch stoats at the right time for dispersal and this means that the numbers are very difficult and it's still a work in progress because we just don't know but what i am doing is all of the dead animals that they're catching uh i am using dna to look at how related they are and then create these sorts of models, which will highlight, these are the areas that we think that they will be moving. And uh, then we can start to use that as a planning tool. So currently we don't know the best uh, ways and the level of connectivity, 
but the models that I'm currently working on should actually do that. This model here is actually for Martins in uh, the US, and so Martins are a large mustelid. So that was done by someone else. Um, something I should just point out, an earlier talk, uh, Patrick Garvey, he was speaking earlier in the series, uh, basically, he's been looking at developing new lures, and the lures that they're developing from uh, ferret bedding look extremely positive. Over time, you get far more catches, which is blue, than uh, with any other bait. However, I need to point out that this changes what's called G0, which is the probability of uh, capture in the center of its home range. And it doesn't change sigma, which is the home range size. And therefore, while this will mean that you can uh, increase the likelihood that you catch an animal, you still need a trap in every animal's home range to be able to have this work. So you can never get around the necessity of thousands of traps if you're doing it by trapping. Something else that has, uh, this is a paper that came out um, a couple of years ago. Uh, from Hugh Robertson, uh, trapping alone doesn't generally eradicate stoats. It has on a few islands, generally smaller ones, but most of the time it doesn't. And that's because there are some animals that just won't go into traps. There are also ones that settle in gaps between trapping areas. And what that meant was that uh, over time, you just get animals that will slowly move into the range that are un trappable or moving into a place that they're not going to find a trap. And therefore, even in situations with pretty high uh, trapping density, you need actually to use toxins to uh, pulse to get rid of those ones that are just surviving anyway. <coughs> so you'll have noticed that so far I've spoken entirely about stoats. Now that's because the only thing that we've ever tried to eradicate uh, from an island by trapping is stoats. Now we have eradicated ferrets and weasels from fenced sanctuaries entirely using bridificum and secondary poisoning. Now, what about ferrets? Well, ferrets may have less dispersibility. They are quite patchy. They don't swim, which stoats really do. And they're primarily rabbit determined. And so this presents some good things in terms of landscape level control in that if you control rabbits, you can control ferrets in a lot of habitats in New Zealand, and Grant Norbury's done quite a lot of work showing that. There is some prey switching initially, but then the ferret population goes down. So that can be quite useful. So basically managing uh, a landscape to make sure that you have low rabbits, that could be using disease for the rabbits, could be using toxin for the rabbits, or different grazing regimes, you can actually get less uh, ferrets. Um, I think that we do need to talk about eradicating ferrets a lot more. And it is something that I think that these are the most likely species to actually eradicate given their um, sort of ecology. Uh, potentially they are something that could be done with the current technology, just with more research to optimize it. Now, weasels, we really don't know anything about, and this is something that's really important. Now, weasels are increasing a lot. There are lots of weasels in uh, suburban Wellington right now. There are also lots of weasels on the Kapiti Coast and uh, in the Hanuas. Now, the Hanuas had a 1080 drop, which got rid of a lot of the stoats and the rats. That means that mice go up and the weasels are determined partially by mice. And so weasels are now a really big thing. Uh, they're lizard predators, as you can see, this one's eating a gecko. And we really don't know much about them because no one studies them. They're really hard to study. Also, female weasels are often below 50 grams. Now, uh, most traps, so the Doc 200s, require at least 100 grams. So a trapping regime designed for stoats could actually create weasel paradise. And this is something that we really need to get on top of and there should be research on because uh, we don't know what's actually happening. Um, as I said, the populations are highly variable and stoat suppression could actually increase them. And something else that's now uh, coming to be important is that they, they have got into almost every fence sanctuary at least once, sometimes uh, multiple times. 
So they've gotten into Zealandia, they've gotten into Brook Sanctuary, they've got into Mongatotari, and it's possibly because they can tunnel through tiny little tunnels that mice make, or they're being picked up by predatory birds. We don't know, but they're getting in. And so this is just a call out saying, we need to do some research on weasels because we know almost nothing about how to actually eradicate them. And going back to stoats, stoats swim up to three, uh, 3K definitely, 5K very occasionally, and they disperse up to 65 kilometers. And they're often basically untrappable. There are ones that will avoid. I had one that went into a trap after, I think, three or four years on Secretary Island. I proved that with genetics. Uh, so that's difficult. Also, the females are almost always pregnant because uh, they're impregnated at birth. And then the rest of the year, they're just waiting. So this is a really big issue uh, because if a female arrives on an island or in an area, she will give birth to a litter. That litter is about 10 to 12 quite often, and that will take off. Uh, in terms of island eradication, this is actually a uh, problem. So right now, uh, as you may have seen on the news, a stoat arrived on Browns Island, almost certainly from urban Auckland, and has been hanging out. And despite lots of traps and no food on the island, it has avoided all traps so far. They've gone out to the island today, might be a new update uh, come tomorrow. There's also one stoat currently inside the fence at Tafranui, and it's been there for many months, and they throw whatever they can at it. It doesn't want to go into a box. So this is an issue in terms of eradication. There are many untrappable animals, uh, definitely with stoats. So, I know that currently that was a review of the big projects that are currently being done. Uh, right now, we can't eradicate uh, mustelids at landscape scales other than using aerial toxins and secondary poisoning. And the trapping regimes, you turn them off for six months and it's probably back to normal. Uh, now, if, now that I mention this, everyone will probably ask questions on it. Uh, gene drives will not work on the timelines uh, by 2050. We're talking centuries for long-lived animals. So we need to come up with something that isn't gene drives. Diseases are not generally eradication tools, but they might be good for control. Uh, and I think that we should do more research on that. And for all of these species, we need to actually look at the true ecology. How detectable are they? Um, how can we lure them? And particularly for weasels and also ferrets, we have very little idea of this so that the modeling really can't be done. Some modeling is being done on stoats and that's a really positive thing. And so we're getting an idea of what sort of trapping density is required, but still trapping is not necessarily the way to go for long-term uh, eradication. Um, but one good thing is, is that in local areas, so if we're trying to protect kiwi, if we're trying to protect pheo, uh, if you trap in those very specific places at high densities, we're starting to get an idea of what is actually required to get rid of those and the lures and traps and toxin uh, rates are being defined. Um, Something else I need to note, uh, a lot of you, because I saw the attendance uh, list uh, from DOC and councils, give me your samples. If you have dead animals that you're catching, I would love them for genetics. And also the, um, mod, uh, the data that you have. So what you're catching, what you're not catching, and the increases in birds would be really good so that we can then uh, review all of this data and go, this is what is required for this gain in terms of any specific bird um, or other animal. So yeah, with that, if you want to give me samples, freeze them and make sure that you've written the date and the exact location because a bag of, here's all the you know stoats from Northland and a giant bag, that would not be useful because I need to know exactly where they're from to do all of this modeling. And a lot of other people have worked on this, and uh, so it wasn't just me. So please, yeah, these are the people that gave me some of the stuff, and I'm sure I've left other people out. Uh, there's a lot of people working on mustelids and very interested in that. So thank you all. 
Well, thank you for that talk, Andrew. Hopefully you're not overwhelmed by mountains of data and dead animals coming your way. Can never get so too many. <laughs> uh, Rose has asked, what drives swimming in stoats? Is it purely push factor of competition for resources on the mainland? That's my belief. So as I said, 80% uh, of stoats die in the first three, four months of life. Therefore, you know, if you are the one stoat that swims to an island and there aren't stoats there, you have won the lottery of life and you're not one of the 80% that die. Uh, but also, they are very adaptable, and I think that they're sometimes assuming a more mink otter role occasionally and going through the intertidal uh, because there isn't a mink in New Zealand. And so they're getting into those habitats, and they just, they're extremely strong swimmers. I have swum them uh, in swimming pools effectively under continuous current. They swim with great confidence. Uh, they are not like ferrets. And yeah, they, they just see an island and I think that they go. Great. Terry Webb has asked, do you have any comment on the effectiveness of A24 traps versus DOC 200s? I only have anecdotal evidence. Uh, from what I've heard from Zip and others, uh, there are probably a higher number of stoats, at least, that avoid A24s than avoid Doc 200s. However, there are stoats that avoid both of them. Um, I think that probably A24s have a place, and maybe there are some stoats that will go in, into an A24 and not a Doc 200 trap. But uh, my understanding is that the Doc traps have a higher kill rate if you can check them regularly um and uh have nice fresh lure so yeah great uh sarah has asked is there a uh you just broke up there sorry so uh is there a difference in male and female dispersal distance and rate in stoats there is Possibly. So on average, the studies that I've seen, males do disperse further. However, the one that dispersed the furthest, which was the 65 kilometers, was a female. So I think that on average, the males do disperse more um, during the dispersal phase. And then also their home ranges are larger and they probably are moving about quite a lot during the time that the females are in heat uh, in um, spring. So probably males are more mobile in general, but uh, a female stoat that swam to Kapiti, so the only stoat that swam to Kapiti so far, or we believe it swam, was female. Uh, and at least one of the stoats that have uh, made it to Rangatoto Motor Tap, which is the 3K swim, was female. One was male, I can't remember what the other one was. So females do disperse very far. Great. So Hink Lowe would like to know what type of research do you suggest we tackle first around weasels, particularly in places like Wellington? Uh, I, I think that we need to know how they're dispersing. Um, so that would be tagging studies where you release them. Um, I think that we need to be able to detect them. And so basically that's the thing uh, for modeling. We need to know what the detection parameters are. Um, and then we also need to know how they disperse. And uh, the problem with a lot of this is that ideally you want to actually stick devices on the animals themselves, which gets very tricky. Mm. So John Innes has asked, um, dogs take some control back off small mammals by scent detection. Do you think there could be a bigger role for dogs with mustelid management in particular? Could dogs help kill mustelids? Uh, I think that the chance of dogs actually killing mustelids is low because quite often um, they go down burrows that dogs can't get to. My understanding is that you can uh, gas. I don't know what the legalities of this, but I know overseas, uh, people can locate uh, stoats and once they find the burrow, then they're able to gas them. So that would be a way for dogs to do that. 
And I think that we definitely need more stoke detection dogs or mustelid detection dogs, given that they're getting into most fence sanctuaries and they're regularly getting onto islands. So I think that uh, dogs are an incredibly useful tool to uh, at least locate them and probably that will be required uh, on both Waiheke and Derville when we get these, you know, 5% or 10% or however many percent of animals don't go into devices. We need to be able to find them and target them specifically and dogs are probably the best way. Uh, James Ross has asked, if there are no mice, uh, what are stoats eating on the Secretary Island? The birds. Uh, so, from memory, there, there was actually one, so they were looking at sable isotopes to see if we could use that to locate where ones were from. There was one or two that had strong marine signatures, and so they were either eating seabirds, I don't think there's too many seabirds there, or maybe fish and crustaceans. But other than that, they're eating the birds in the forest. Uh, and uh, also if there are any uh, skinks left, so the Fjordland skinks. But yeah, it is surprising that they were able to survive at relatively high densities despite having no rodents. I was shocked that one survived on Browns Island for at least a month, given that there are no rodents there and it's grassland, but apparently there were pigeons. Great. Um, M. Oyston has asked, uh, in regards to detectability of stoats in low density populations, do you think we can have confidence in lured trial cameras or trail cameras as a reliable detection device or should they just be treated as a relative index measure as per other traditional detection devices? I think that uh, cameras, lured cameras with good lures, which as I said, we're working on, um, uh, the best method that we have other than dog teams going out um, and then if we're talking about in very low density it is sort of presence absence that we're looking at uh, always um, but basically if you're wanting to know an effect of control where you still have animals you need to do something like occupancy modeling or have an index and it gets incredibly difficult. So to do that uh, for Orokanui, I was recommending at least, I think, 60 cameras. Uh, and that's just because these animals have very large home ranges. There aren't actually that many of them out there. And so you start to need very large camera grids to be able to detect them and to see changes and do the occupancy modeling, which is something that you then have to factor in, okay, I need ten twenty thousand dollars worth of cameras to do it but it is a way of uh detecting some difference the only other way is to basically look at the birds and go well is this having an effect on the ecological outcome that we're wanting because assessing how many stoats are in an area is incredibly difficult and expensive potentially quite often it may just be best to go well did we make more kiwi rather than did we get stoats below 90% of what they used to be because that's a very hard thing to measure. Thanks. Uh, Tim has asked, do you want dead weasels or mainly stoats? I'm interested in dead everything, uh, as long as it's from the right place. So yeah, send me an email with what you have uh, or what you are likely to get. And no, I am interested in them as well. So Jean Jack has asked, we had a prior presentation indicating ferrets influence stoats in the landscape, which was what Patrick covered on Monday. Yeah. Uh, she's asking, are we potentially doing more harm if only removing the ferrets? It's complex. Um, there, there is the possibility of that. Uh, stoats in New Zealand um, are largely forest and ferrets are largely grassland. There are some exceptions to both of those statements. Um, and so maybe if we removed ferrets, uh, there would be more stoats. I think that uh, Patrick's evidence shows that they basically are shift workers. And so if you have both of them, the stoats take the day shift and the uh, ferrets take the night shift, and so overall, probably it's best to just get rid of the ferrets. Um, I think that definitely there could be mesopredator release in terms of uh, stoats to weasels, 
because the weasel density could actually get quite a lot higher than stoats. And so if we're caring about something like um, skinks or geckos, uh, it might be that stoats actually benefit those. Uh, I think that would be the main mesoprieta release, but again, it's very untested. Uh, Derek's asked if you've got any recommendations on traps for weasels. Uh, traps for weasels, you can, so DOC 150s are uh, registered for weasels. Uh, you need to get the weight down. So you have to set a dock trap. And so having a weight that, I don't know what the minimum weight for a dock 150 is, but you probably need to set it down to about 40 grams uh, to be able to get the female weasels. They are really tiny. Um, other than that, you can actually use uh, Victor snap traps. Uh, that's at least used overseas for them in the right sort of environments with the right lures. And so, that's a way of catching weasels. Uh, there's also, you can live trap them uh, with tomahawk traps or similar. So things that you'd use for rodents with the right bait for a weasel. Yeah, there is a Victor trap already registered for stoat control, which would probably work very well on weasels. Yeah. So our final question for the session is from uh, Frank Millennia, and he's asked, is there a seasonal difference in trappability of stoats? Are they harder to get during embryonic diapause, which obviously would be a great time to catch for them? Uh, so effectively, stoats, the female stoats, are always in embryonic diapause. They are impregnated before they open their eyes shortly after birth. So in the month after they're born, all female stoats become pregnant. So embryonic diapause, basically the egg just sits there fertilized, doing nothing uh, for 10 months uh, or nine months or so. So they are relatively trappable when they're young. Trappability, particularly for females, goes significantly down over winter. And uh, this may be because of uh, home range changes. It may also be because of uh, behavioral changes that they become more wary. And I do have a Mars and application in to hopefully look at embryonic diapause and it'll be fantastic. Uh, but yeah, basically in terms of trappability, you probably want to get them uh, at least before June uh, to get those females because it gets very, very hard to get them later. Great. Well, thank you, Andrew, for your presentation today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us over the week and I'd particularly like to thank Tiffany who our events coordinator who has managed our new format as she said at a fairly short notice. Uh, we'd love some feedback on how you found this format and whether you preferred it to our normal one day conference. We're also considering running a monthly webinar series focused on biosecurity so if you have any topics that you're interested in hearing more about please get in touch. Thank you all. Kakite ano. Kakite.